Uh, Betsy is a 10-year survivor of follicular uh, non-Hodgkin lymphoma. She's going to tell you her story. She's also, also the uh, author of uh, Adventures in Cancer Land, uh, which is available out here, and we offer all of you to uh, either buy it or you may get one. I don't know what they're, they're working on something out there. Uh, <laughs> She also writes a very popular column called uh, Candid Cancer uh, and has been a journalist and author, and she's an advocate for all patients all over the, really, the country for lymphoma. She's very active in many of the not-for-profit groups. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you here. She's from Ann Arbor, Michigan, and we've been on phone conferences for about nine months now, and it's a pleasure to finally meet her in person. Betsy, we want to hear your winding road, okay? Thank you so much. Wow. You know, as Dr. Gregory mentioned, we've been on phone calls for about nine months, and I can, I've seen about literally that much of what it took to plan this, and I can tell you that it took a whole lot of hard work. So before we get, get started, I just want to thank Dr. Gregory and the folks at Rush, Scott and Charlene Seaman um, of the Chicago Blood Cancer Foundation and Liz McMillan of Hope for Lymphoma. Would you guys please stand? I think you're, you need, deserve a hand. <laughs> Dr. Gregory, Scott, Liz, hello. There you go. Okay, so 10 years ago, I couldn't have imagined being alive in 10 years, much less that I would be able to participate in an event like this. So when I tell you that I'm not only excited, but delighted to be here, I truly mean it in more ways than one. On January the 7th, 2002, I was driving on the interstate when the emergency room doctor that I'd seen the weekend before called to tell me that he suspected lymphoma. I wondered if, instead of continuing on to pick out bathroom tile, maybe I should head to the mortuary and pick out a casket. Well, I didn't go to the mortuary, but that call did send my husband and I, Alex, on a detour we never wanted to take. Sound familiar? Yeah. So further tests confirmed low-grade follicular small cleaved lymphoma, grade 1 non-Hodgkin, stage 4. That was from my biopsy report. And I morphed from happy-go-lucky person to frightened patient. Dr. Mark Kaminsky at the University of Michigan became my doctor. Some of you know, may know him as the uh, developer of Bexar, but at the time, both Bexar and Zevlin, the two radioimmunotherapy RIT drugs, were under FDA review. So chemotherapy was really the only choice I had. But as you all know, chemotherapy generally only slows the disease. I learned that sooner or later it would return and require stronger drugs. Then the whole cycle would repeat until, well, you know. At that time, the median cycle, or the median time from diagnosis to death was eight years. Alex and I were afraid that lymphoma was stealing our future. But hoping to have as much future as possible, I put on my big girl panties and turned my body into a toxic waste dump. More specifically, I enrolled in a clinical trial which gave me an option that I wouldn't otherwise have had. And yes, that's a plug for, for clinical trials. Um, what I was to take was eight rounds of CVP followed by a vaccine six months later if I stayed in remission that long. But after two rounds, my disease was growing like weeds. CHOP with Rituxan came next, but again, my disease raged on and treatment had to be stopped halfway through. My options were dwindling as fast as my malignant cells were multiplying. Clearly, lymphoma was fast-tracking me to the short side of the median lifespan, and chemo almost let it succeed. On the bright thing, on the bright side, chemo did a lot of things it was supposed to do. It deprived me of my hair, helped me to forget what day it was, made me a world-class couch potato, gave me numerous side effects, and even sent me on a couple of vacations to this cozy little int hideaway that I called Hotel Hell, otherwise known as the University of Michigan Hospital. And that's Hotel Hell, no reflection on Michigan. Best of all, chemo bought what I needed most, time. 
Time for the FDA to approve a new treatment, RIT, and it successfully killed off those cells that were try so trying to kill me. Not that I'm counting, but today as I stand here, I've been cancer free for 10 years, four days, and about 40 minutes. So much for incurable, huh? Sorry, docs. Now, I personally know people who took RIT in clinical trials as long as 17 years ago, and who, like me, have been living normal, healthy lives uninterrupted by treatment after treatment. Are we cured? Well, we're certainly living like we are. And with results like this, it's sad that radioimmunotherapy is so underutilized. But that's all another story. And I'm really not suggesting that everybody run right out and get RIT. What my story illustrates, and really what the point of it is, is that newer treatments are using different mechanisms to attack the disease. And they're producing much better results. Just in the last 10 years, so much more has become available. And today we have a real smorgasbord of better options and more options and more on the way. And in large part, we got them because patients participated in clinical trials and helped dedicated scientists pu push progress forward. And whenever I have a chance to thank them, I take it. So I'd like to ask the doctors who are participating in this symposium to stand. Just stay standing, please, for a minute. We're going to have to clap all over again. So no, Dr. Rummel, stand up, please. Stand up. I have something to say. Folks, these men and women truly are part of a very small but elite group of physician researchers who are leading us all on the road to a cure. And doctors, I think I can speak for all of us when I thank you not only for taking up your weekend to teach us so much, but for choosing to spend your lives helping us. And you have done so much to help so many of us to live and love and laugh past lymphoma. So let's give them another hand. They deserve it. Thank you. That chokes me up, but <laughs> they really are. So, what happened after my last treatment? Well, I think we all know that cancer doesn't end with the last treatment. Hair grew back, side effects faded, energy returned. But just because there was no outward sign of illness didn't mean that I had recovered. On the contrary, illness lingered beneath the surface for months after treatment ended. For a very long time, I lived in limbo, trying to figure out how to live in the same body that had just tried to kill me. How could I trust it not to pull that same stunt again? I won't even ask if anybody has felt the same way. So how do we adjust to all the changes the lymphoma brings into our lives? I can tell you from experience that adjusting to them once adjusting to them once, it doesn't happen once and then it's over. It's an ongoing, ever-changing process. But one thing is certain, everything we experience becomes a part of our lives and none of us can go back to our lives without lymphoma. But we can put the experience into the much broader picture of our lives and become what I call savvy survivors. And savvy survivors include not just those of us who have the disease, but also those of you who care for us, the angels among us, okay? So what's a savvy survivor? Each of us defines our own meaning of survivorship, but I think we'd all agree that we want to move beyond lymphoma and get the most out of life. So using getting the most out of life as a broad definition, we can all become savvy survivors by taking charge and taking action. We do this the same way we became empowered patients, by identifying our needs and finding good, reliable resources to help us through the challenges and using them. In other words, savvy survivors become capable and confident navigators through all the phases of survivorship. 
Now, of course, the road to survivorship is different for everyone, but we all encounter some bumps along the way. Some of the bumps I encountered felt like more, more like giant potholes that I thought would surely swallow me whole. And rest assured that there's no right or wrong way to travel this winding road. The only requirement to reaching our destination, to getting the most out of life, is that we keep moving, that we don't get stuck. We all have the skill set to do this because every one of us has encountered bumps in the road of life. And we figured out how to get over them. And there's no better time to apply this skill set than, than when we're on the road to savvy survivorship. Now, one of the first things we all encounter is uncertainty. How do we adjust to when the uncertainty that lymphoma thrusts into our lives? The simple truth is that the only certainty in life is uncertainty. Lymphoma doesn't thrust uncertainty into our lives, it simply exposes it. It reminds us that we can't always shape our own destinies, nor are we always in control of our own lives, much as we'd all like to believe. But knowing that, we can direct our energies to shaping what we can, rather than worrying about what we can't control. For example, it's natural to worry about recurrence, but will worrying about it today stop it? Will worrying about it today help us through it if it does happen? No. Fear of, future un fear of future uncertainties does nothing more than rob us of present joys. So rather than worrying about what may or may not happen, can we focus on what we can control to facilitate our recovery and maintain our health? Since preparation helps to reduce fears, can we, all, can we learn all we can about new and emerging treatments so that we're prepared if necessary? Sure, we're doing that today. Can we focus on what we can do rather than what we can't? Sure, we can all do this. It just requires action. Setting goals is a good place to start because goals give us purpose. It doesn't matter how big or small the goals, accomplishing, accomplishing them is what matters. So our goals have to be realistic. Now, if my goal is to run a marathon the day I finish treatment, uh, I really set myself up for disappointment because my body needs time to heal. But what if my goal is to reduce fatigue and one way to reduce fatigue is to get up and exercise? That's a realistic goal which can fuel action, the action I need to take, which is to get up off the couch and do some walking. Let's talk about hope. It ebbs and flows and fades sometimes, doesn't it? We rekindle and nourish hope by taking action because hope is grounded in possibility and fueled by action. Hoping that my first treatment would work was a realistic hope, but when it didn't, I had to let go of that hope and take action to find an option that would give me a new hope. When something is no longer possible, it's okay to change our hopes. If we don't, we set ourselves up for frustration and disappointment. So taking action helps us realize our hopes and reach our goals. But are we sometimes too paralyzed by fear and worry to take action? I've been there. And I've got 10 years of having experience, or experience of having pity parties. So if anybody is new to this and needs a pity party planner, I can help you later, okay? Kidding aside, it is okay to have a pity party. It's okay to cry. Tears can be cleansing. And it's normal to feel strong emotions because the emotional impact of cancer is just as hard or harder than the physical impact. And we're bound to en encounter stressors that trip us up and sometimes even push us flat on our faces. Getting up requires what? Oh, come on, this is interactive. Action, have you guys not learned? <laughs> Action, keep thinking. And what do we need? Stress busters. They might include yoga, meditation, guided imagery, listening to music, long walks, exercise, or doing something fun. Yes, it's still fun to cheer on our favorite teams, even if the only thing we can do otherwise is lie on the couch. Go blue. Sorry. Just seeing if you guys were paying attention. Although I personally prefer the, the term club camaraderie, support groups can be gr a great stress buster. For me, going to the club was like get going to the doctor, only instead of getting infusions that heal my body, I got infusions from others 
who have walked this walk, and they calmed my fears and comforted my spirit. Now, my mother had a great stress buster. If I were feeling blue, she would tell me to turn myself inside out. Now, I couldn't get a slide for that, sorry. What she meant by that was when we shift our focus from ourselves to others, we have less time to think about our own problems. Believe me, I tested this theory a lot when I was sick. For example, sometimes I would literally drag myself out of bed or off the couch and into the kitchen and bake a cake for somebody just because I could picture the smile on their face when I saw it. And you know what? It seems like such a little simple thing, but it really did lift my spirits. Now, for all you dog lovers, equal time. <laughs> Isn't laughter a powerful antidote to stress? Look around for humor every day. It's really all around us. Now, I know that taming fears and worries isn't always easy. It takes a conscious effort to push them aside. And sometimes just making the effort seems insurmountable. But isn't the price of giving up too high? So find what works to bust your stress and be willing to try new strategies because the more strategies we have, the better, because nothing works all the time. But sometimes, we just can't overcome the stress by ourselves. At any step along the way, even the most glass half full people are susceptible to depression and anxiety. And that's when highly trained professionals can help. Unfortunately, there's still a stigma surrounding mental health. But I'd say to anyone who's reluctant to uh, getting professional help to think of it this way. We welcome anti-nausea or pain meds for the physical side effects of cancer. So when we think about the emotional pain as a side effect, which it really is, then there's no more, no more shame, no more reason to be embarrassed about getting help for it than there is about getting help for pain or nausea. And there's no shame in admitting that coping with cancer is really hard because it is really hard. As a longtime survivor, I can assure you that eventually lymphoma won't be the first thing you think about in the morning or the last thing you think about at night. But from time to time, we're all going to bump up against some events that trigger some angst. For example, has anybody but me secretly rejoiced when a pain in your belly is really just gas and not a recurrence? <laughs> yeah. And how about those medical tests that forever punctuate our lives? In all these years around scan time, it's never ceased to amaze me that ration and logic, I have no symptoms, have shifted so easily to doubt. Will I dodge that bullet again? I've yet to meet anybody who doesn't twinge or panic around scan time, no matter how far they are past treatment. It's a perfectly normal reaction and so common that it's even acquired its own name, which is, oh, come on, guys. Thank you, scanxiety. OK. I'm going to fess up to you guys. People look at me and they say, oh, you're 10 years out. You, it's, no. I have a confession to make. Not long ago, I had a real good case of scanxiety. And after all these years, yeah, I should know better. Statistically, the chance it recurs was slim. But all the rational, logical thinking in the world didn't stop my mind from playing dirty tricks on me when a slight but constant pain in my side persisted for several weeks. My annual CAT scan was right around the corner, and while I was waiting, I got more and more nervous. I finally fessed up, took action, um, to a group of other NHL survivors who came to my rescue and helped me to regain my perspective. When Dr. Kaminsky reported the results, that is Dr. Kaminsky, he exclaimed, you're perfect, to which I replied, I've been trying to tell Alex that all these years. <laughs> Alex groaned and said, thanks, Mark. I'll never be able to live with her now. We all had a good laugh, and no one but me noticed that my stomach unknotted, my knees quit wobbling, and my whole body relaxed. And the pain, a pull tendon. So let this be a lesson to all of us that not every little ache and pain is a recurrence, but it's not so unusual for us to think that it is. So just keep your perspective. 
I share my little emotional backslide to assure you that we're all going to stumble occasionally. It's normal no matter where we are in this journey of survivorship. Regaining our footing takes time, support, effort, action, so don't ever be afraid to ask for help or reach out for support. Not one of us can ever do this alone, and thank goodness that not one of us ever is alone, no matter how much we feel like we are. Remember club camaraderie? There really are plenty of extended hands to hold ours if we let them to guide us along the way. So we've heard a lot about this word cure. How important is it? And after 10 years, am I cured? Well, somewhere around five years past treatment, I asked Dr. Kaminsky if he could say that I was. But my medical status remained durable long-term remission. That's medical ease for it takes years to prove that new treatments are curative. So I took matters into my own hands and I looked up the word cure in the dictionary. And it said to bring back to health. My health had been brought back for five years, so I proclaimed myself cured one day at a time. And I quit asking Dr. Kaminsky because I never expected to hear from him that I was cured. But it didn't matter because we both agreed that I was healed. And at the end of the day, how can you prove cure? It's when I'm going to die from something else, right? <laughs> so where's the proof? Well, last spring, Dr. Kaminsky gave a talk in Detroit about some of these same advances that we're hearing about today. He also said that he and other, some other doctors are beginning to think that follicular lymphoma may, in fact, be curable. After his talk, I was on a panel of survivors and told the story that I just told you about looking up the word cure in the dictionary. And I got to the part about where I never expected to hear from him that I was cured, and he interrupted me and he said, Betsy, okay, you're cured. <laughs> you might have guessed that it's pretty hard to make me speechless. He made me speechless. I looked at him and I was grinning, or he was grinning from ear to ear. And of course it was great to hear him say that after all these years. It shows that the whisper of cure for all of us is getting a little louder as these newer, better treatments prolong remissions and save more lives. But the words were no guarantee that something won't crop up tomorrow, and they didn't change a thing about the way I live. And so I ask, is a chart stamped cured a prerequisite for enjoying life? Of course not. Labels don't give us permission to go forth and make the most out of our lives. We give ourselves permission to use the resources and take the actions that will help us make the most of our own lives, no matter where we are in this journey. None of us would have chosen to have lymphoma, but we do have a choice about how we live with it. Making that choice isn't always the easiest path, but it's the path that leads to making the most out of life, to getting busy living. And take it from me, there is plenty of living, great living, with and beyond lymphoma. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Betsy. Say that again. Oh, there was one more little I was going to get that a little teary-eyed. Yes. I know which ones. <laughs> we do it together in clinic. Yeah. Right. That was wonderful. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions or comments for Betsy? Because I have taken the liberty to um, ask Janine Gautier to come forward and comment on some of the very important uh, points that were made by Betsy in how to deal with cancer. And Janine Gautier is the psychologist, Dr. Janine Gautier. Uh, I asked her to stand when they said doctor. She said no. Uh, <laughs> who runs our integrated medicine program at Rush University. When Rush University Cancer Center came together, um, Janine, one of her biggest things was, please let me have my integrated medicine program right next to where you see the patients. Because if someone, if you say to someone you have a new diagnosis of cancer and they start crying, they need somebody now. And maybe the person next to them or maybe the doctor doesn't have the time to help them. 
And so Janine has so many times run into our clinic, and I know she's been extremely busy. She will drop everything and come in and spend a few moments with our newly diagnosed patient or our relapsed patient. And I'd just, Janine, like to introduce you and have you comment on some of what Betsy said. That's Welcome. great. Thank you. And then take it from here. Oh, Go ahead. Well, what a wonderful and inspiring presentation by Betsy, and I don't think that I could do it any better, but um, as a clinical health psychologist, my training is really in how to keep people as healthy as possible, even in the face of an illness, and I, I think uh, many of Betsy's words um, fit so well with my own philosophy about how I work with individuals um, in kind of using those principles to look at how do we get individuals back into living even when they do have a, a life-limiting or life-threatening illness. Um, so many of her words about, you know, what are the resources out there, and many times I think there is a lot of stigma about seeing a psychologist. In fact, one of the radiation oncologists one time said to me, um, I tried to refer someone to you, but you've got to change the name of what you do, he said, when I said, we have someone in psychosocial oncology, he says, no, no, I'm not crazy. And I think it's so true. And so I think as the Cancer Center was coming together and, and, and one of the things we talked about was how do we comprehensively treat patients? So there is the medical aspect, which is critically, critically important, and we have amazing physicians here that know all of the cutting-edge research that's going on medically to take care of the physical health of individuals. But how do we integrate not only that medical and physical health with kind of our emotional, psychological, spiritual health that makes us a whole person. And in fact, it was really very much um, their forethought with the Institute of Medicine's um, report in, I believe it was 2007, looking at cancer care for the whole person, meeting the psychosocial health needs of patients and families that are going through this, because it is really a family disease. You know, the individual that's diagnosed is going through all the treatments and having their own unique side effects from the treatment, but families and caregivers and loved ones are going through their own set of unique side effects from the treatments and from the process of going through uh, cancer treatment. So that's where we come into play. And so what we have is we have this integrative medicine program where we can take care of all of those needs, everything from acupuncture to yoga. Uh, we have providers right there in the cancer center that patients can have access to. So if it is dealing with some of the side effects of treatment, the acupuncture treatments or massage therapy, who hasn't had a massage that kind of walks away from that massage? And I think Betsy's kind of comment about multiple hands that make, you know, the lift that people up. And I think massage is so incredibly beneficial because many times that touch is so important to kind of help people relax. and. Um, looking at kind of that mind-body connection. There is a stress response, and talking about the stress, we're going to talk about that a little bit on the panel, about how stress influences not only our physiology, but also our emotional, psychological self. So we have that. We have massage therapy. We have nutritional counseling. Uh, there's more and more research coming out looking at nutrition, and in fact, there's actually now an organization that has been recently formed looking at uh, the nutrition aspect, and it's called um, the nutrition science. And so they're looking at food and what is really the role of nutrition and, and how do we absolutely prevent diseases through l the use of nutrition. So I think it's critically important to look at all of the pieces that go into keeping us as healthy and getting back into living our lives. Um, so I, I took on the, when they came to me and said, we really want you to develop this, it was critically important. So we do have the ability that we are right there in the cancer center that, you know, when individuals hear that diagnosis, and it's so shocking at times, to then deal with the uncertainty, you know. And, and I think that that comment of, you know, the only thing that is certain is that there's going to be a lot of uncertainty. And how do we, you know, prepare for that and kind of say, okay, I can't control what's going on in the future. You know, uh, there was a, 
a, a phrase that I will talk with patients about, you know, the past is history, we can't change it. The future is a mystery, I don't know what's gonna happen. All I have is right now the present and the present is a bit of a gift, so how do we stay in the present? And there's a tremendous amount of research on being very present and kind of dealing with, kind of being mindful in the moment and how do you kind of allow yourself not to get so caught up in that. Um, certainly the anxiety is going to be there. The scanxiety, I love that term. I think that is fabulous. The anxiety is always going to be there. And I, I tell people all the time, I'm not here to take your anxiety away. I don't want to do that. Anxiety is protective. You know, there are times when we need that anxiety um, and that's protective and actually the research would show that there are times when some stressors are actually helpful and can actually increase our immune response. There are some, t some types of stressors in it that can do that. But what I want to do is help you to kind of identify is the level of anxiety I'm feeling right now appropriate for what's going on? And certainly in the face of any life-limiting or life-threatening illness, there's going to be anxiety and so we don't want to necessarily get rid of that because I think as Betsy said, you know, gee, that pain in our side or in our back, you know, once you do have cancer, I think you do have to be much more vigilant about your health, and it is important. And so how do we help individuals to deal with those realities that they're, they're living with, but also be able to live their lives in the fullest way possible? So I think with that, one of the things we'd like to do before everybody goes back to um, the, the, remaining of the remainder of the program uh, to help kind of people stay kind of awake now that you've had a morning full of and wonderful information. Now we've had lunch and there's always kind of that post-lunch kind of like, oh, I want to go to sleep. I have it all the time at, at work. You know, you get through your morning, you have a little bite to eat and then you have to go into your afternoon. So one of the things that I've found is some very wonderful yoga poses that are very, very simple that you do in your chair. And so, you know, when everybody hears yoga, I know a lot of things that go through people's minds is, oh my God, I can't twist like that. I can't go into those pretzel shapes. But actually, yoga is really more, uh, there's, there's a number of different yoga types. And actually, I've learned this as I've been working in the integrative medicine program. Um, there's certainly the, you know, very aggressive and very vigorous yoga, um, wh which is very physical. Uh, but there's also a restorative yoga, which I think for individuals who are dealing with illness can be incredibly beneficial. And even for some of us that work in the area, you know, ways to kind of restore ourselves. So these are things that you can do while you're sitting in your chair. The one thing to be very um, aware of and mindful of though is kind of your breathing. Your breathing is very important. Um, and we wanna teach people to breathe in their bellies, kind of do that belly breathing. One of the things that happens, think about it when you're under some sort of stressor or something happens, <gasps> we gasp or we hold our breath. We hold our breath till the next scan. And so what happens is our brain our bodies are amazingly put together, but our brain works then to say, oh my gosh, I'm not getting enough oxygen. I need to jumpstart this system right now. So what happens is the brain releases certain chemicals into the bloodstream. The neuroendocrine system gets kind of triggered. Uh, the adrenal glands dump adrenaline into the bloodstream, and we all know what adrenaline does. It pumps up our heart rate, it pumps up our breathing, it tightens our muscles, and I heard Betsy so wonderfully say, gee, as soon as the doctor said, you're perfect, that pain in her side, she like, <sighs> relaxed. She started to actually breathe again, and her brain says, oh, I can trigger the relaxation response now. I can loosen those muscles. Um, so just being aware of your breathing. And we're gonna just do a couple of very, very, very simple poses. You can all choose to do them or not, but they're just very simple. So the first one is actually just called the lotus preparation. And traditional, trans in traditional Sanskrit text says that padm Padmasana, or lotus, destroys all disease. And so this is just a very simple, simple way to kind of just be very 
mindful. So if you just sit and place your palms hand up, get your neck and spine kind of straight, sit straight up, and you just want to begin to calm your brain and just kind of, <sighs> you've had a nice lunch, it's beautiful food, very fulfilling. And just place your palms up and the thumbs and your first finger touch, just touch. And it helps to free your spine from any stress of sitting. You've been sitting all morning and now sitting for lunch. And then what you want to do is to take one leg and just cross it over your knee. Just put one knee over your kind of, what I'll show you, kind of like this as you're sitting there. If you can't, if you can't, if you can't, don't worry. But certainly just allowing yourself to be very calm. But it's something that you can do at home or if you're sitting in your chair or if you're feeling particularly fatigued. Just sit and just kind of give yourself a moment to do that. All right, beautiful. The next one is called mountain pose, and it's something you can do very simply. You want to kind of just be a little bit careful. I think you're kind of, you might have to move some of your chairs around a little bit just to be able to do this. But what you want to do is sit erect, sit straight up. You want to sit straight up. Put your hands out and clasp your hands and extend them forward. And now turn your palms away from you. And raise your palms up until your palms face the, feel, the ceiling. And then just stretch, feel your neck and feel everything growing. And it lengthens your muscles, it stretches your muscles. And if you'd like, it's a little tough in here, but at home you can actually take them out to the side. It's, all right. But it's kind of a nice stretch which lengthens your muscles and kind of gives a little bit of oxygen in there. Okay, and then the next one is just, it's called the twist. And you're sitting in your chair, and if you sit straight in your chair with your back to the back of the chair, and just place your palms on the side of your chair, and you wanna just twist with your left shoulder going back, and twist your sides, moving your left shoulder back and expanding your chest. And then when you feel that stretch, just gentle stretch. And then go to the other side and just feel a gentle stretch. What this does is it helps to kind of rejuvenate your muscles and, and kind of bring some oxygen in there. And then when you're at home, I'm not going to ask you to do it here because you'll have your face right in your plate of food. Um, <laughs> But one thing, one thing that you can do at home if you're feeling like you need a little rest, restorative kind of pose is simply to take your, sitting in your chair, you want to fold your hands on a table and just put, put your head gently down and just give yourself two or three deep breaths into your stomach and out. And typically when you do the deep breathing, you want to breathe in for a count of four and out for a count of four. But that's a nice restorative kind of way to kind of rejuvenate yourself. So with that, I think we're right at the end of the hour. Thank you so much for your time. Dr. Gautier is so fabulous. And now that she has us all relaxed, uh, my job is to unrelax and say we're going to be on air and back in business in three minutes. <laughs> so join us.